Pride Arts, and it's my privilege to be the principal here at Fremont High School. On behalf of the Fremont Union High School District, I'm proud to welcome you to our campus today. Along with all six board members and an array of students and staff, we're so glad that you could join us this morning. It is a sacred honor to be in the field of education, and at Fremont High School, we take this responsibility seriously. We share with you the conviction that fate is not fixed by the circumstance of birth, and each day we feel a sense of urgency to deliver a world-class education to each and every one of our students. The challenges that face our nation are reflected in the faces of our students, who come from a very diverse cultural, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. At Fremont High School, we have over 60 different languages that are spoken in our homes. 40% of our student population receives free and reduced lunch. And yet, amidst these challenges are profound blessings, and our dedication is unwavering. This is an especially sweet time of year for our seniors, as many of them are making their college choices for next year. We know already in the fall that Fremont students will be attending colleges such as MIT, Stanford, Columbia, Yale, uh, University of Notre Dame, as well as colleges throughout California. The commitment to excellence and equity is also ingrained within the Fremont Union High School District. As you enter today, you should have been given a copy of our recently adopted organiz organizational the organizational belief statements, and they deal with our teaching and learning. These statements reflect the aspirations of our professional community and guide the work that we're doing to ensure high levels of learning for all of our students. Many of you also received a copy of Stories of American Rookies. This is a recently published book that details stories from our immigrant students in Fremont, Fremont Union High School District. In these essays, you're going to see the effect of powerful English language development programs on students challenged to do rigorous coursework while adjusting to life in a new country. The resilience, tenacity, and courage that we see in these is an inspiration for us, and we trust it will be for you as well. I'd like to recognize the VIP the elected officials that are here today. If I leave any names off, I apologize if, the, if it weren't on the list. Uh, we have, and if you would just hold your applause to the end, I'll go through the list of names. We can applaud everyone at the end. Uh, our, our own superintendent, we have Polly Bove. Our current student board member, we have Hadar Sachs. Uh, the, current, the, board, the student board member that's coming in for next year, Surya Sarnath. Uh, the Metro Ed superintendent is Alyssa Lynch. From the Mountain View School District, we have Ellen Wheeler. Wheeler. The direct, uh, superintendent of Sunnyvale School System, we have Dr. Ben Picard. Sunnyvale School District Board of Education, we have Anita Herman. Also from the Sunnyvale uh, Board of Education, we have Nancy Newport, Nancy Newport, sorry. From the Berryessa Unified School District, we have David Cohen. From the City of Sunnyvale, we have Jim Davis. Principal of Monta Vista High School is April Scott. The Vice Mayor of Cupertino, Gilbert Wong. The Vice Mayor of Sunnyvale, Jim Griffin. Griffith. Uh, Council Member of Cupertino, Rod Sinks. Council Member from Sunnyvale, Chris Moylan. Uh, I don't have an affiliation, I apologize, Ann Crosby. And from our Board of Trustees in the Fremont Union High School District, we have Jeff Moe, Nancy Newton, Bill Wilson, Barbara Dunas, Hung Wei, and lastly, our Mayor of Sunnyvale, joining us today is Tony Spitaleri. So we give applause. <laughs> So co-sponsoring today's event is one of, one of Washington's most effective leaders, Mike Honda, who's been representing Silicon Valley in Congress for over 12 years. As a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee, <laughs> Sorry, I'm with this. As senior member for the House Appropriations Committee, the congressman has fought for responsible government spending on what will keep America competitive. He has simultaneously ensured that Silicon Valley sees the rewards of his work, and has secured nearly half a billion dollars in federal funds for the communities and constituencies in our region. As a former educator for 30 years, Congressman Honda is also changing the way the country considers reform of its educational system. Having created the Educational Opportunity and Equity Commission that will be talked about in just a bit, Congressman Honda is pioneering change in how and what our students learn, authoring the Enhancing Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Education Act. As Chair Emeritus of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, and co-chair of the Immigration Task Force, his colleagues also look to the congressman to represent the rights and responsibilities of new and emerging constituencies in the Bay Area and the United States. It is with great honor, it is a privilege, to introduce the representative and a friend to all of us in the Education Community, Congressman Mike Honda. Thank you, Hospital College of the Fremont Union High School District. Uh, 
I used to work as a science teacher at Senegal High. Go Jets! <laughs> I just want to welcome everybody to attending this morning's event. And this is just the beginning of most important dialogue to secure an excellent and equitable education for each and every child. And I want to thank um, all our panelists here and our special guests. We're all here because we recognize that every child deserves an excellent education. And to the students here, uh, we are here for you. And you are our future and our hope. And with that hope, I'm going to be to cope. Now, I'm not going to get into any rap, but I just want to let you know that. I really uh, appreciate your presence, and uh, this, is, this is for you. The responsibility of educating our nation's children is the responsibility of each and every person in this country. 30 years ago, the landmark report, A Nation at Risk, warned us of the rising tide of mediocrity if we didn't follow the report's recommendations. But nothing came from the report's uh, recommendations. As a result, uh, I knew that it was time for a new report on education. I knew it was time to act in order to secure our nation's future for education opportunities for each and every child. Through my role as an appropriator, I secured funding to convene the Excellence and Equity Commission. The President and the Secretary, who is here today, uh, subsequently authorized the charter and gathered 27 of the nation's foremost leaders in education and advocates for children. Some of them are here today, and you will hear from them soon. After 22 months of careful research, discussion, debate, and deliberation, what was birthed was huge. I always say that um, the, the gestation time for an elephant is 22 months. This is that huge. <laughs> and so in 22 months, we've birthed this report. And it's going to be in the hands of all of us very soon. This report, uh, I would like to think, <clears throat> as the tone and demeanor of the report, that would be uh, in complete contrast to Nation at Risk report. Children are the focus of the report. And the focus on all school reform needs to be on each and every child. I think the other thing about this report that has to be noted is that every member of the commission comes from education, from the different parts of education, so they know of which they talk. They're all experts in their own areas. If you can think about 27 of them come together, it would take 22 months for them to come to an agreement and consensus to make sure that we're able to come uh, come together with a report that we can be proud of. This report also gives to us an, a, an intuitive validation, and this is a moral and ethical and right thing to do in providing every child in America an equitable and excellent education. I'm excited to see what lays ahead of us today in today's discussion and more so, uh, so that we can achieve as a nation when we attend to every needs of each and every child. With that, it's going to be my honor to introduce to you the Secretary of Education, and we call him Arnie, Arnie Duncan. I want to acknowledge Secretary Duncan's leadership in pushing forth this report. Nothing happens without his uh, support. I look forward to partnering with them and all of you to secure an excellent and equitable education for all children. I also look forward to hear from the Secretary his views on achieving equity and excellence during his remaining time in office. So I give to you, Secretary Arnie Duncan. I'll say a couple things. I want to be very brief so we can hear from the other panelists. I really want to get to Q&A with the audience. But can I just ask all the students to please stand quickly and let's give them all a huge round of applause for their <laughs> I hope you really understand this, that all of us and so many of the adults in this room come to work every single day because of you, because we think you have this amazing potential, because we want to help you get there. Um, if we're doing a good job, we want to hear that. If we're doing a bad job, we want to hear that, the things we can do better. But the, the motivation for all of us, literally why we get up every single morning, is because we think every child in this country should have a chance to get a great, great education. 
Um, I just want to thank the, the principal and the staff of Fremont High School for their hard work. Please give them a huge round of applause. I love that we're doing this, this, this uh, conversation here. This school reflects, I think, the best of the United States. It is incredibly diverse. Um, you have young people, many first-generation college goers, many new to the country who are chasing the American dream. An American dream and a high-quality education, those two things are inextricably linked. Um, I'm sure many, many of your parents came to this country basically for the sole purpose of making sure that you had a better opportunity in life and had a chance to get a great education and the chance to grow up in a diverse uh, community, working with, being friends with children who come from very different backgrounds. That is such an important thing. It's, it doesn't exist in too many communities. So that is not ever, don't ever let anyone uh, tell you that's a weakness. That's an absolute strength. And your ability to work in, in, uh, with folks who uh, you know, come from wildly different backgrounds is huge and hugely important. And wish you all the best and love your, again, honest feedback is what we can do better to make sure you're getting a great education. Um, I want to thank Congressman Honda for his uh, extraordinary leadership. And this work is, um, this is in his blood. He's you know, a former teacher, a former principal. Um, he has lived the American dream. And it's just been a joy to partner with him on this and so many issues. Uh, quite frankly, we need a lot more folks in politics who actually understand education and care. And if we had more folks in Congress with both his heart and his brain, um, we would be much further along than we are. So, Congressman said we put together 27 people. Um, he did not say we put together 27 people who all saw the world the same way. And uh, they absolutely did. These are 27 of literally the smartest people in the country. These are world-class experts. And the fact that they were able to work together, coming from very, very different vantage points and experiences, and come up with such a powerful document as the one that they produced is extraordinary. And they had to compromise, they had to listen, um, you'll hear from them. I'm sure not one of them here got everything they wanted exactly uh, in the document. But I think we as adults have to find ways to find common ground and to compromise and to get to a better place together. Or else we just sort of keep fighting all the same battles. And I always say when adults fight, kids lose. It's like families. And so the, the commissioners, I thought, did an extraordinary job. To be very clear, I provided no leadership. This is all the commissioners working hard. And there were times when my staff sort of thought, well, this may not end up anywhere. This may not happen. Uh, that birth may not ever uh, come to be, that, that, that ele the baby elephant. Um, but they got to a remarkable place. And I just want to thank them for their, uh, not just their intelligence and passion, but for their tenacity. And again, their willingness to really uh, to, to work together in ways that many folks thought were impossible. But folks out of a list of names said, wow, that's a really interesting group. But is there any way any of these guys are going to work together in some of the long histories? Um, they did an amazing job. The report they produced is one that I think is extraordinarily profound. I just sort of want to talk through a couple of the principles and how it shapes my thinking and the president's thinking. Um, this is, can't be a report, as the council said, that just sort of goes on a shelf. This report is a call to action. It's a call to behave differently. And uh, it's one that I've taken very, very seriously. I'll start on the early childhood education side. That if we're trying to promote, again, both equity and excellence, closing gaps, raising the bar for everyone, arguably the most important thing we can do is to get our babies off to a good start. And the commission, the commission pushed on this very hard. Um, if you watch the State of the Union, if you've seen the President's budget release, the President is asking for $75 billion to put behind high quality early childhood education. It is a massive investment. If anything else we've done up to date pales in comparison. And I think there's many, many things that we're working on. This is arguably one of the biggest gifts that we can give to the country. Uh, we know far too many of our children enter kindergarten already behind. The average, the average child coming from a poor family starts school at five, 12 to 14 months behind. We have to stop playing catch up. We have to level the playing field. Um, all kinds of economists who have done longitudinal research for decades, folks like James Heckman, have found a seven to one return on investment ROI. So for every dollar that we invest, we're giving back, some say seven, some go as high as $17 at the back end um, in less dropouts, less teenage pregnancy, less folks getting locked up, 
more folks graduating, more folks getting jobs. Um, if any of you can get a seven to one return investment in the stock market, you're doing pretty good. You're doing very well. If we can do this and help and change kids' lives, um, this is, uh, again, I think maybe the biggest gift that we can give the country. Um, we would do it without raising the deficit. We do it by adding 94 cents per, per pack tax on cigarettes. One of the other big benefits of this is we estimate an additional 233,000 fewer young people will ever start smoking, so the health benefits for them and reductions in health care costs will be very significant. This is not a federal mandate. We simply want to invest and partner with states who are already investing, and this is a 10-year commitment. Um, it's not just a four-year-old play, although that's where the big uh, bulk of the money is. This is a zero to five play. And uh, Captain Sebelius is a good, good friend in HHS. We're working on literally on a daily basis. She would focus much more on the zero to three space, birth to three, home visiting, other proven programs. We'd focus on fours. But think about as a country, think about if we had the entire nation, in particular the disadvantaged children, coming to kindergarten, ready to learn, ready to read, with the literacy and socialization skills intact, Think what a difference that would mean for school systems, for teachers, and ultimately for these young people. Um, for this to happen, I know we have a huge champion and congressman. We have to work on this in a bipartisan way. And whatever folks can do here to talk to their leaders, um, regardless of politics or ideology, to support this would be extraordinarily helpful. Final thing I'll say is obviously there are the childhood community who loves this, but there are many, many CEOs, many corporate leaders who love this because they know the long-term benefits. There are many military generals who love this because they know the benefits. There are many faith-based leaders who love this. There are parents who love this. Uh, there are many uh, folks who are in law enforcement, police chiefs, love this because they know the reductions to crime. So this is one where we can really build a very, very unusual uh, coalition to come together to make it happen. And uh, we're going to spend a ton of time and energy working on that. Secondly, the, the commission talks about how we elevate and strengthen the teaching profession. And how do we respect teachers in very different ways? How do we attract the greatest talent? How do we better retain that talent? How do we compensate that talent? Teachers at this school and across the country do a pretty extraordinary job, often without enough resources. But we're not attracting as many great folks as we want. We lose about half of our good young teachers early in their careers because they don't feel supported. We lose many good young teachers when they get to 27, 28, 29, and they want to start to buy a house or, or uh, start a family. And uh, think they can't make it on teacher salary. That makes no sense. So we've launched what we call the Respect Project, Respect Initiative. There's a huge amount of information on our website about that. The president asked for Congress to give us five billion dollars to put behind how we fundamentally transform the teaching profession. This is not tinkering around the edges. This goes to who we're recruiting in as 18-year-olds and how we're taking maximum advantage of the talents and skills and expertise of 58 or 68-year-olds at the back end. Not everyone agrees with me. I've been very public about dramatically raising teacher salaries and principal salaries, starting teachers at a much higher rate, having great teachers great principals be paid a heck of a lot more. Um, yes, it costs some money, but great teachers, great principals change kids' lives. It's the biggest in-school factor. Everyone here knows it's been <laughs> Everyone here knows those teachers who made a huge difference in our lives and helped us do what we're doing. Um, third, the commission talked about financing. And this is an area where I would give my team and I a relatively low grade over the first term. And the, the fact of the matter in this country, eight to 10% of the money usually comes from the federal government, usually about half comes from states, and usually about 40 at the local level. And because we are so heavily reliant on property taxes in this country, what happens across the country generally is the children of the rich get a lot more. The children of the poor get a lot less. When I ran the Chicago Public Schools, my children, 90% um, of whom were African American Latino, 85% of whom lived below the poverty line, my children got less than half the money spent on them each year as districts literally three, four miles north of us along Lake Michigan. And think about less than half the money year after year after year, 13 years. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. Um, actually, it helps to exacerbate, perpetuate achievement gaps and what I call opportunity gaps. We ended up actually suing the state through the inequitable funding. We lost the suit, but I've lived my entire life knowing these huge disparities. Um, have we done everything to sort of drive a national conversation around this? Again, I don't think we've done enough and really appreciate the, the uh, commission challenging us on this. Um, there's some very significant work going on here in California that the governor is leading and it's controversial. Not everyone agrees and 
I don't know the details probably nearly as well as the folks here and in the audience, but I think what the governor is fundamentally trying to do is to make sure that children, whether they're English language learners or children with special needs or children coming from poverty or children who are homeless, have more resources attached to them because we know it costs more to give them a world-class education. And so I think he's fighting the, the right fight. Um, it is a difficult environment when no one is, you know, has enough resources, but to act like it's okay for the children who have the greatest disadvantages to have the least resources, it is not okay. And it's again, it's something we have to fundamentally challenge. We want to do a better job. I Commission had a focus on high poverty communities, you know, concentrated, uh, concentrated trans poverty. And that's the kind of community that I grew up working on, working in on the south side of Chicago. So it's where my passion, it's where my uh, drive and interest in education comes from. One thing we tried to do on a relatively small scale that's been pretty successful is the Promise Neighborhoods Initiative, which is built upon Jeffrey Canada's amazing work in uh, in Harlem, in New York. The president is asking our budget for a five-fold increase in money for Congress neighborhoods. It's probably the biggest increase of any line item. So it's sort of a, a, a direct reflection of, of the commission's hard work. And what he's pushing really hard, which is the right thing, is it's not just an education issue. We're working very closely with, with HUD and working very closely with the Department of Justice and working with the Department of Agriculture and rural communities. Uh, working with HHS on the early childhood side, this is becoming and should be an administration-wide commitment, not an education commitment. And using all our scarce resources, the President talked to the State of the Union about identifying 20 communities and thinking about from babies, you know, through adults, how can we fundamentally change the opportunity structure so that we can break those cycles of poverty and social failure and give young people a chance. Again, with Congress's bipartisan support, we would have a chance to do something very, very special there. And the, the final one, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, is the, the, the other theme that the Commission talked about, and again is reflected beautifully here, is this idea of how do we foster and encourage diverse communities and diverse schools. And it's one that uh, is hugely important to me. Uh, students can be absolutely prepared academically, but if they're not comfortable and confident with children who come from different backgrounds, I actually think we put a limit on their success. We live in a shrinking world. Uh, we live in an inter interdependent world. Our children need to be comfortable and confident in very diverse settings, helping each other, working as teams, learning from one another, having their own ideas and thoughts challenged. Um, I don't think it would give us an area where I'd give us a relatively low grade. I'm not sure if we've done enough to try and foster creative climates in which uh, integration happens. Um, schools generally reflect their communities. The fact of the matter is in many communities, people tend to move away from people who are different from them and towards people that are like them. And uh, that makes it hard on the education side, but it doesn't mean there aren't some tools and levers and policies that we can put in place to try and encourage learning in uh, diverse communities and, and diverse schools, and we want to get better at that. But this is a, a, a thoughtful, uh, incisive, you know, hugely important document that um, has and will continue to shape my and the president's thinking. But this is one I think that should you know, last long after the next you know, three years, nine months that we're here, that hopefully will change the national conversation on education. And I just really want to thank all the commissioners for um, an amazing amount of hard work. To be very clear, none of these guys were paid. Um, they're all volunteers. I hate to think how many hundreds and hundreds of hours they put into it. But again, they did that not for me, not for the president, but because of you guys, because they really believe in you. And uh, you're some real champions here, and I thank them for the effort. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Secretary. Um, the moving right along are um, panels I hear, and it's going to be moderated by a, a uh, very um, skillful person, uh, Mariano Montino Poyer. Uh, we call him Tino. Uh, he was the co-chair along with uh, Chris Edley, who was the dean of uh, law school at UC Berkeley. Uh, Tino Clayton is a professor of law and the dean of uh, Johnson Family Scholar at Stanford Law School. His research and teaching focus on administrative law, executive power, and how organizations implement critical regulatory, public safety, migration, and international security responsibilities in a changing world. He recently became the co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation. And uh, the, the two co-chairs really were very skillful in moving the whole commission 
forward and to come to this conclusion. So I just want to say to the co-chairs, to the members of the commission that um, I really, really deeply appreciate your work, <coughs> your dedication, but on behalf of each and every child in this country, I just want to let you know that they may not know the impact you may have on them today and tomorrow, but know that you will have that impact. So I give you today's moderator, my friend, and your moderator, Tino. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, and good morning. It is um, a great pleasure to be here today, and I feel like, uh, in some respects, our work is all the more supported and energized by the fact that we have public servants like Secretary Duncan and Congressman Honda. We could not have done this report without them. I think they inspired us to think of ourselves as veterinarians who are giving birth to this elephant. That's not something any of us planned. Uh, and I'll also say that I'm going to try to do a good job right now because I was asking why the orchestra pin was here and they told me if I didn't do a good job. Go ahead. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I was walking my daughter to school. She's eight years old, and we live maybe five or six blocks away from her school. And as is often the case with an eight-year-old, she was telling me that she didn't really want to go to school. And I said to her, come on, there are all these great subjects. Tell me, what's your favorite subject? She said, lunchtime. <laughs> what's your second favorite subject? Recess. Okay. So I knew I wasn't getting anywhere. And I said to her, do you know how lucky you are? Okay, she said, I know I have to listen again. I'm lucky because I have food on the table. I've heard it all before. And I don't know what got into me. I said, no, you're lucky to be growing up in this country. And she, without missing a beat, said, uh, like the little lawyer that I'm sure she will become. She looks straight up at me and says, what's so special about this country? Anyway? And um, I said to her, I think what's special about this country is actually two things. Well, the first thing is the fact that we're walking to a public school that exists because in this country we believe that every kid, doesn't matter where they live, deserves a shot to succeed in life. And the second thing that's important about this country is that the future is not set in stone. And in a sense, what this report tries to do is to take those two things very seriously. And to understand that the fact that the future is not set in stone is both an extraordinary opportunity but also a great responsibility. Because what it means is that this ideal that I tried to articulate to my daughter and that I think got into her head by the time she got to school is not something that we can take for granted. It's not something that we can just simply believe and assume is going to be there. And frankly, it's not even something that we can believe for sure we have already achieved. If there's one thing that brings together all these 27 commissions, uh, some of whom I will be very privileged to introduce in just a moment, it's the conviction, it's the absolute faith that we can do better, that we have not gotten to where we need to get to. But notwithstanding whatever progress we've made in the enterprise, and it is an extraordinary mission to educate everybody in this country, to give everyone a fair shot, we're not there yet. And whatever you can say about how good schools perform, and even the best schools, I would argue, can do better. It's certainly true that many, many kids in America are not getting a good education so far. So uh, this report is an effort to grapple with that and to take it seriously, and to speak to the present, to people like Secretary Duncan, who supported us, who urged us to be bold, to do what needed to be done, like Congressman Honda, who is playing this critical role in appropriations in Congress, but also, honestly, to speak to the future to speak to those people who are in the audience who are students here, who are going to be the ones who are going to be running this country someday, and to basically lay out a strategy. And Chris Edley, whom I am very grateful for being the co-chair with me on, and whom I learned a lot from, and I believe that thanks to the work of these commissioners, we have come up with a strategy that really matters. Now, rather than telling you about it directly, what I want to do over the next half hour or so is to invite some of my fellow commissioners, whom I'm so grateful for, and whom we would never have been able to do the report without to speak to them. So I'm going to just briefly tell you a word or two about them. Please hold your applause until I've introduced all of them. Then I'm going to ask each one one single question to get the discussion going. And then after that, we'll take a short break and we'll reconvene and uh, we will take questions and answers. Linda Darling Hammond is a Charles E. Buchanan Professor of Education at Stanford and a colleague uh, for research teaching and policy work focus on issues of school restructuring, teacher quality, and education quality. She was my colleague on the Obama transition. She was working on education reform and uh, transition issues. I was working on immigration, and she's absolutely terrific, and I'm glad she's here. 
Rick Hanushek is also a colleague at Stanford. He's the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is an extraordinarily well-versed expert on education policy and the economics of education. He received his PhD in economics from MIT and is a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy and was a terrific ally in this report. Robert Teranishi is Associate Professor of Higher Education at NYU. His research is broadly focused on race, ethnicity, and the stratification of college opportunity. His work has been very influential at the federal and state uh, levels, and he was one of the key voices on the commission, helping us keep our eye on the ball in terms of how do we get this report to speak to who goes to college and making sure there is a pipeline of students who go to college. David Chiara is the Executive Director of the Education Law Center in Newark, New Jersey, and one of the nation's premier education finance litigators. He's also a practicing civil rights lawyer in other areas. He has conducted research, writes lectures on education law and policy, and is a passionate advocate for education equity and education reform. Last, definitely not least, Ralph Martiri is the executive director of the Bipartisan Center for Tax and Budget Accountability in Illinois. He's one of the preeminent experts on education funding and uh, the Illinois state budget deficit. He's also a distinguished, that great subject to be an expert on, I'm sure. <laughs> He's also a distinguished lecturer in public policy at Roosevelt University. And given Ralph's extensive experience in bringing people together in a bipartisan way, he was absolutely critical. Please give all of them a round of applause. Linda, let me start with you. What are you excited about that's in this report, and what are the first steps we have to take to realize this vision? Well, I think the secretary did a terrific job of sort of giving us the overview, and he started with early childhood education, which is a really important place to start. Um, but I would say that the very next step has to be addressing the great inequalities in school finance that we have in this country. Um, high achieving nations across the world fund their schools centrally and equitably. We have a huge disparity across states, within states, and within districts and the resources that are made available. The students, our uh, governor, as uh, the secretary pointed out, is really uh, focused right now on both bringing more resources into the system and seeing that they're distributed equitably. The federal government can help other states become as passionate about that as well as our own state to maintain its commitment by um, insisting that as we look at progress in closing the achievement gap for students, we also look at progress in states in closing the opportunity gap for students. And a huge part of this is what ends up becoming uh, an opportunity gap in, uh, with respect to the quality of teaching that uh, students receive because salaries and working conditions, if those are inequitable, also create uh, disparities that we're concerned about. And it's particularly wonderful for me to be here at Fremont because this is a school that has really devoted itself to some of the things in this report. Uh, it's a school that's been devoted both to equitable education progress and to the training of teachers. Um, Fremont was the first school that when I came to Stanford became a professional development school partner uh, with us to in bring schools and universities together to train teachers well. And so I want to shout out to the uh, cooperating teachers who have trained steppies and the step graduates who are here uh, teaching in this school and the commitment that the school has had to building that uh, building block. We talk about investments in the preparation of teachers so that if you want to teach, uh, we will pay for your education, as is true in other countries, uh, that the preparation will always be of high quality, that teachers will have mentoring available to them uh, so they don't get discouraged in those early years, have professional learning, collaboration time, uh, and ongoing support for their work uh, so that at the end of the day where it really counts in the classroom, uh, we have the investments in both excellence and equity that only great educators can really provide. Thank you, Linda. Rick, uh, you stuck with us for the entire time, and I wanted to just ask you, uh, were there any surprises for you in the conclusions and recommendations of the report? Uh, the first surprise is, um, before I say anything about that, I want to thank Congressman Honda for this commission and Secretary Duncan. Um, I know that people in Washington tend to talk as if the budget is some great mystical thing and they put out numbers like $75 billion for early childhood education, which mean nothing to anybody else. Uh, these numbers are out of sight. 
Um, but the number that I've been focusing on uh, is one about the achievement gaps that are related to these $75 billion. If we could bring our Latino and African American students up to the level of our white students, economist projections suggest that that's worth $50 trillion. Um, Secretary Duncan talked about $75 billion. This is orders of magnitude larger. It's like a 12% raise for everybody in the U.S. for the next 80 years, if we could do that. Um, so this is a matter that the commission agreed with completely, uh, that there are twin gaps. We have two gaps. One is that some of our disadvantaged populations are not up to the level of our advantaged populations. The second gap is that our best students are not up to the level of world standards in terms of uh, achievement. And both of those have huge international and uh, ramifications. My colleague, Condi Rice, um, speaks about education as a security issue, and it is, because whether we are competitive in the future and have the influence internationally depends in part on whether we can get our schools up to being competitive. Now, the surprise, the surprise is 27 people on this commission um, who came in with positions staked out on every issue you can imagine. These are professional people who knew what they were doing. Um, and the one that I would characterize first um, that's simplest is sort of a caricature of the bipolar nation, uh, nature of this commission. Um, there's one group um, that talks about policy, uh, and these are, excuse me for, these are, are levels of policy that have nothing to do with what actually goes on in the classroom, but they're at a higher level of discussion. And the policy discussion of one group is to say, our schools will be fixed if we just have more money for them. And there's a caricature of a second bipolar group that says, we've got enough money, we just have to use it better. And the amazing thing for this commission that was split down the middle on that divide, um, in the end, people uniformly said, we have to have sufficient resources, we have to ensure that they're equitably spent, and we have to assure that they're used effectively. And everybody agreed that you could not separate out any part of that if we were concerned about the future of our schools. Robert, I want to pick up with you just exactly where Rick left off. You're an expert in higher education. What implications do you think this report has for the pipeline of students going to college? So uh, earlier, the nation at risk was uh, referenced. And um, at that point, about 30 years ago, only about 15% of Americans were earning a college degree. Right? So that wasn't that long ago. But it's, very, it's a very different context for where, where we're at today. And I think all these students would agree with that. Um, you know, today, students are not only more likely to uh, aspire to attend college, um, it's something that they realize is it's really necessary, right, for pursuing a, a good job and earning a livable wage. And um, so, while access to college is important for individuals and families, um, I, I think increasingly what we're recognizing is that it's important and really central to how we think about our domestic policy. So, what our education system does in the near future will determine our nation's long-term prosperity and our ability to compete in the global economy. Um, so it's really our hope that this report can serve as a, dis uh, a catalyst to disrupt the status quo. Um, we need more tools, more perspectives uh, that help us realize the potential of a more uh, equitable and accessible system of education. Um, so this goal is not only important for uh, the democratic mission of education, I don't think we talk enough about that, um, but it, it's really necessary, considering that we're in the midst of some of the most uh, rapid demographic change um, our nation's ever seen. So we're in the Silicon Valley, right? Um, it's really a glimpse into the demographic future of our nation. Um, nearly half of the workforce is foreign-born, uh, largely Latino and Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 
um, close to two thirds of the kids are immigrants or children of immigrants. So this report helps us identify ways to expand opportunity, reduce barriers, and kind of uh, recognize that that uh, these these changes to our nation are things that we have to see as assets and not deficits. Um, I want to acknowledge, you know, earlier the principal had said you have all these students going to MIT and Harvard. You know, I, I have a project where I work with De Anza College, and Brian Murphy's here. He's the president of De Anza. De Anza is given a world-class education, right? The, the, these institutions, these community colleges, this is the really the future in terms of um, helping students of a very large concentration of our uh, students pursuing college, you know, giving them an avenue to be able to do that. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge it. David, you were instrumental in helping to fashion the framework for dealing with education finance here and articulating what Rick was alluding to, the notion that adequate resources are necessary, making sure that they're allocated equitably and that they're spent effectively. I want to ask you to take a very long view and tell us what you hope people will say about this report 20 years from now. Uh, <clears throat> so, the first thing I want to uh, mention is, the, is about the disparities. I think this report really uh, gets at the issue of uh, the fact that that we're not going to be globally, our, we're not going to get our kids to where they need to be to be productive citizens, productive citizens, productive in the economy, to get our economies to be productive at the state, community, state, and national level, um, unless we address the uh, deep disparities in our educational systems that really are a holdover from the last century. Uh, and the disparities are in every which way. They're in terms of inputs and outputs, outcomes, we've heard a lot of that from the Secretary, from Linda, from others, um, resources, uh, there are uh, disparities at the state level, among states, between states, within states, uh, within schools. Um, so our, our, our 50 state systems, if you will, because we have education in the United States is not a national system, it's controlled by the states, are uh, the hallmark of those systems I think this report brings out are these deep disparities across the board. Um, and I think what this report does, and I hope it does, you know, is it reshapes the debate about what to do about that, brings it forward to say, this can't be about just fixing individual schools or dealing with specific micro problems um, in schools or in um, among teachers or et cetera. It has to be about building strong systems of public education that are gonna serve all kids, uh, including the most disadvantaged kids. Um, and, and that really starts with the state building strong state systems and having the state support local communities build strong um, um, local systems. And I also hope that what, and what this report is really getting at is a set of recommendations which are about building strong systems of public education across the United States that serve all of our kids. Dealing with some of the fundamental building blocks, if you will, of those systems, starting with whether we have adequate resource, whether every child goes to a school that has the resources they need in order to uh, achieve a high quality education. What I do hope on school finance long view is that we begin, to, this report I think begins to change the conversation as Professor Hanyashek talked about in terms of moving away from just dollars uh, conversation to really uh, getting to the point where we have finance systems that are redesigned by the states and by local communities to ensure that they are delivering the cost of getting all kids to achieving high standards. So this notion that we move away from simply talking about dollar inputs to a rational process of concretely linking our funding systems to what all kids need, including low-income kids, English language learners, children with disabilities, children with special needs, children in high poverty, schools and communities, that they, those systems are there to basically support um, those kids and the teachers and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the staff that are working with those kids to ensure that they achieve uh, a high quality, rigorous education that prepares them for the global economy and for productive citizenry. Thank you very much. Wow. You've had plenty of experience trying to bring together unlikely allies in Illinois. What has to happen for us to move forward now? 
Right. So I, I'm supposed to talk about the obstacles we face in a political process on solving these challenges, which is really pretty easy to do, and I'm going to do that. <laughs> Hear all that, and then you know remove those obstacles. And, and, and many of these obstacles are political, of course. Now, the organization I work for is bipartisan, not nonpartisan. That means my board of directors literally does not like or trust each other. And this is a really good thing because it allows us to focus on good government, good policy. We don't care if you're left wing or right wing. Here's the data. Here's the best practices. Go do that. Okay. And before I get into identifying the obstacles and how we're going to overcome them, and I'm confident we will overcome them, I do want to thank Congressman Honda and Arnie Duncan for their leadership. We talk about everything that's wrong with our political process. Here's two individuals who embody everything that is right. They have stood up in, in an environment where everyone is a deficit hawk and talking about retrenching fiscal. They have stood up risked political careers to say no, in this case, we must invest more in our children. It is the right thing to do, it is the politically difficult thing to do, and we should applaud them very much. Now, why am I convinced we will overcome these obstacles? We all share, Americans share broadly a belief that every child deserves a high quality and meaningful educational opportunity. There's two reasons for that, for that belief. And you're gonna, you are gonna prove one of those reasons to me today. I want a show of hands out there. Who has a kid? Anybody in this room? A lot of people? Hands down. Who here has ever been a kid? Anybody in this room? <laughs> Every American gets the value of education because we've all been children. And we've all had to go through the process. So we share this value. But we also know that it's linked to realizing the American dream. Now what is the American dream? It's that the circumstances of your birth do not dictate the limits of your future. You can, in fact, in this nation, as Tino was telling his daughter, become anything you want to be. But we know now, in a modern global economy, data time, the only group of workers in our nation since 1980 that have seen their incomes increase at a rate greater than inflation have a college degree. Because the only workers that really have seen an increase in their purchasing power, that have gotten the kind of job that have put a kid or two through college or a car or two in their garage, have a college degree. Which means the quality of your K-12 through education has to be so high that you develop those numeracy and literacy skills you need to go on and credential yourself at the next level. Now here's the problem. We do, in fact, as everyone on this panel has pointed out, not have a national system of investing in our children. This means that way too often, the resources available to provide those things we need, we know constitute a high quality education, just aren't available, particularly in low and middle income communities. Why is that? It is because we have relied so long on local and state resources as the primary vehicle for funding education. That won't work. And the first person that warned us of this was President Nixon in 1972 when he pointed out that because of the growing correlation between economic viability and educational achievement, it was no longer a local concern that we deal with this problem. Yet that's precisely how we fund it. And if we continue to rely on local and state resources as the primary funder, we won't change this problem. There are 50 different political systems that are fighting over tax policy, which needs to be reformed if states are going to fund educations appropriately. That's a tough fight. It's a tough fight for this reason. If you look across America, in affluent communities, you see affluent individuals have low relative tax burdens compared to their incomes, and high quality public education is available, high quality public services available. That's what they have. Go to low and middle income families. They pay a lot of their income in taxes. And in exchange, they get the worst schools and the lowest quality services. And this is the crux of our political problem. 
Low and middle income families don't want to pay more in taxes because they feel overtaxed. And they're right. And when you talk about tax reform, it doesn't resonate with them. They think I'm going to have to pay more for this lousy system that's not giving my children access to a quality education. Flip to the other side of the income ledger, you've got affluent individuals saying, why should I pay more? Look how great my local school is. Look how great things are in my community. And this has to be overcome, and it can only be overcome if Americans go back to their core belief. We are a nation where everyone should have this opportunity to become anything they want. We will only get there if we as a nation invest in every child. Invest in those aspects of a public education that we know drive student achievement. And there are tons of data which tell us what those reforms are. But to overcome this political hurdles based on tax policy and partisan sniping between the parties, you need to become engaged. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. You need to go to your congressman and say, I want you to work with Congressman Honda and fight for making national investments in all of our kids so that we're not turning around the 5% of the worst performing school districts in America. We have at least 95% of our school districts all excellent, all with the capacity to educate their kids. That's a national investment. That's a national priority. This is not a spectator sport. It involves your input. If we work on that together, irrespective of our worldviews, I guarantee you, with the leadership that we have in Congress, we will turn this around, and we will win. So thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I, uh, I, of course, confess that I could listen to my fellow commissioners for hours, and in fact, uh, I've done so. <laughs> But, but I do want to thank everybody. We are on tight schedule, but this phase of our event, unfortunately, is concluding. I would like to especially thank Secretary Duncan and uh, Congressman Honda for organizing this event and taking time out of their busy schedules. And uh, after a short break, we're going to turn it over to Edwin Tan, who will moderate the question and answer portion of our event. Thank you so much. Actually, you can just well, go straight into Q&A, because we know we have a pretty tight schedule to keep. Uh, I know Dr. Cuellar has to leave to actually teach his classroom of students, so if you could thank uh, Dr. Cuellar again for moderating the panel. Uh, at this time, uh, we are open to uh, q and a session. Uh, if you do have questions, please raise your hand. What we'll do is I'll call on you, and then we have ushers in the aisle with microphones, so when I call you, please make your way to the aisle. Uh, to the lady right on the aisle up there. Uh, if you can just keep your questions distinct for the sake of time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for all of this uh, amazing work. Um, my name is Roxana Marishi. I'm a faculty at San Jose State University. I train teachers in the credential program to teach educational psychology. My, um, my request is that when we talk about the opportunity gap in terms of research, in terms of resources and teaching, that we also consider the opportunity gap in terms of students being allowed to be in schools. There's a disciplinary gap in our schools as well, and if there could be attention to the disciplinary strategies, a lot of the um, ex harsh exclusionary strategies that push students out of school for nonviolent crimes, it pushes them into the school, school to prison pipeline. We have one in 100 citizens in prisons right now, and a lot of that is driven through the juvenile justice system, which is also rooted back into the schools. So in terms of the equity and excellence, if there could be attention paid to that issue very seriously, it really, I think it would be beneficial for all our students when we talk about these issues. Thank you. Uh, would you like to take that question? Uh, I, I would just note that this is something we talked a lot about on the commission. Uh, there's a great deal of concern about it, as you know, in many states, including California, there's legislation now to try to reduce suspensions, expulsions, exclusions of all kinds. Um, and I think in the compendium materials, there are um, some recommendations for how to uh, address the very serious concern that you, you note, uh, which we share. Any question? Uh, down here in the front. And while well, she's getting ready, the if you are looking for the compendium, you can look at it for each and every child.org. We do have the reporting compendium online. Hi, my name is Ellen Miller. I'm from uh, Mountain View 
the U.S. Wind School District Board of Trustees and Lady Freeman voters. I'm thrilled at the emphasis on all of your early childhood education. But I'm worried that exactly like the last uh, panelist said, the stumbling block in California around funding quality early childhood education is that parents who have it don't want to pay for parents who don't. So I, I'm wondering if any of you have some suggestions for those of us who are trying to help this happen. Um, I think David would like to have a question. Well, um, I think it starts with uh, what, the, uh, what the report and actually what the president I mean, the president's announcement about preschool education was really extraordinary. Uh, it actually represents the kind of sea change that this report talks about in real time. Because it's the first time that the federal government has said, you know, we already invest a lot in the early education and care of our children. We do it through child care uh, money. We do it through Head Start. We do it through public school. But it's all disconnected. It's disconnected in terms of the state level. It's disconnected in terms of the programs and the quality of those programs, and it's also disconnected from K-12 education. So one of the ways I think we have to build support for the President's initiative and to get states to make the kind of commitment they need to make to build, I'm going to go back to this point I made earlier, which is about building strong systems of high-quality public education. We have to make the case that that means, at, at the very least, for low-income children, for children in poor communities, for disadvantaged uh, children, um, that they have the same kind of access to high quality early education that other children get, and that it's part of the whole package of K-12, of, of the K-12 educational uh, system. So I think what we have to do is um, really shift this conversation around to start talking about the essential, that, that if, we're, if as a nation, we are going to close achievement gaps that we've now been talking about for you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. We're not going to do it unless we ensure our most vulnerable children access to well-planned, high-quality, early education, frankly starting at age three, but I'll start with four. And the President's initiative really opens up that space, it seems to me, because part of the problem has been that the early education policy in the United States has been incoherent at the national level. And what the president is talking about is what we're talking about, which is if we can get the, and what Ralph just mentioned, getting the federal government to take the lead, to say we're gonna get our act together, develop a coherent policy towards, the, towards early education linked to K-12. We're gonna repurpose our investments, pull them together, get them organized, and then we're gonna get to the states and say, now look, we're going to put a lot of money on the table for you to build the kinds of strong systems that we need. And frankly, we have examples of that. I mean, I've, I've worked on, uh, on the Abbott Preschool Program in New Jersey, which is considered to be one of the, we spent 15 years working on that program. And it's now considered the best program in the United States, linking child care, Head Start, and public school classrooms in that kind of systemic approach linked to K-12 with adequate resources and the like. So we know how to do this. So we just have to continue to build the will, and I am really emboldened, I think, and, and, and really um, just so delighted that the president uh, uh, has taken this on, because I do think there is consensus in the country, growing consensus now, that if we don't do this, we're not going to we're not going to get to where uh, to where we need to be. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to add one quick one quick comment to that, and that is, I think we've done a very bad job of allowing the debate to be over us versus them and not recognizing that education is a national interest and that bringing up all children to our, um, our good level of education benefits everybody in society. And one of the main elements of this report is trying to make the case that it is in everybody's interest, including the well-off people's interest to ensure that everybody's got us. And so to answer your question head on, the League of Women Voters has a huge role to play here. You're nonpartisan, you have active Democrats and Republicans. There is a lot of fatigue nationally with emotional appeals for this poor kids. People are tired of hearing that. But 
Whether you're a liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, for the most part, Americans are fair. And what they aren't getting is good information. So I think here, as in any aspect of education, you make a data-based argument. And you say, look, you want a thriving U.S. economy, right? Right. Here's the tie between educational attainment and economic growth. Here's what will grow our U.S. economy. Well, that's good. And by the way, here's the crucial role preschool plays in driving enhanced student achievement, particularly for low-income populations. I didn't know that. Well, now that you know that, would you be willing to pay a little bit more for it? Well, yeah, kind of, I would. And, and I know that that's the response. Because you know, a big part of my job is to go to affluent communities and explain why they have to pay more in taxes and the money's not going to go back there and it's not quite as fun as it may sound as an initial bluff. <laughs> <laughs> but if you put the data out there, folks will hold their nose and support it because they are fair. What they're not getting is a rational basis for them to take money out of their pocket and put it somewhere else in their community. When they get that rational basis, you're not gonna get everyone. You'll get six or seven out of 10, and that's all you need. All right, uh, the student in the back of the room, green shirt. Hi, Congressman, hi, Secretary. Um, I really like what you guys are saying, you guys are saying excellent things, but I have a question about college. So, nowadays there's a college bubble. The cost for attending college at four-year college these days is exponential. It's huge. Gotta see it. But the job market, forget that it's awful. The <laughs> wages for you know, paying student loan debt is huge. So, in the end, nowadays, there's a real crisis where the student loan debt is a burden. So, do you guys have any thoughts on that? What do you guys think of the situation? or at the supermarket or doing my dry cleaning, um, I hear about it on a daily basis. And it's not in disadvantaged communities, it's in middle class communities where families are really, really struggling. You guys are looking this you know, straight in the eye. So no easy answers. A couple quick things. Um, for me, this is about shared responsibility. So 40 states, Republican and Democrat, 40 states have cut funding to higher education. And maybe no more so than out here in California. So states have to invest. They have to stop disinvesting. And when I go to the National Governors Association, I push very, very hard in that area. Um, secondly, universities have to do a better job of keeping tuition down. Some are doing this well, some aren't, using technology in different ways. And universities have to do a better job of building a culture not just around access, but around completion. The goal for all of you is not to go to college. The goal is to graduate. The lifetime dividends are huge. So we're trying to figure out what we can do one of the things I'm most proud of that we accomplished first term is we got an additional $40 billion for Pell Grants. $40 billion without going back to taxpayers for a nickel. We simply stopped subsidizing banks, put all that money to young people, and we've gone from 6 million Pell recipients to about 9.6 million, more than a 50% increase, many first generation college goers. One thing we're thinking about is how do we incentivize states and schools to do the right thing? The president proposed in his budget a billion dollar race at the top for higher education to again challenge states to reinvest, challenge universities to keep down tuition. And you can go back to Ralph, regardless of politics or ideology, I just ask you guys as voters and citizens, regardless of where you come from, 40 states cut funding to higher ed, did 40 states cut funding for prisons? And I promise you they didn't. And I always wonder why we much prefer to lock people up at 40, 50, 60,000 dollars in the back end than invest just a couple, you know, a couple hundred, couple thousand additional dollars in the front end to educate them. Politicians of both parties do that because we as voters allow them to do that. together, right? <laughs> Everything's connected. And when we don't do things right in the beginning, we pay in the long run. And I think um, the secretary mentioned about
schools versus prisons. If we pay attention to each and every child's needs, to assessments, we wait for the child and be able to produce and come up with the financing for each and every child, I think that investment will pay off in the long run because the way we build prisons in California is we take the third grade achievement test to predict how many prisons we're going to need in the future. That's sick. Number two, the price of going to college is based upon room, available space, and things like that. So when we look at funding institutions, we're choosing in this state to build over 20 25 prisons, public and privately run, over universities. I think we built something like one UC campus and one state campus, Monterey and Merced, in over 20 years. In how many prisons have we built? So there is a disconnect in how we look at using our public funding. If we invested in kids, keep them in school and not kick them out just because they had an infraction. Because that's the beginning of a, a betrayal in, into the future. So that we, if we keep the kids in and we work with them, they may not end up in prison. So we have to be able to understand all that connections together. Uh, I think we have time to Thank you, Congressman Honda, and Secretary Duncan, and David Lopez, President of the National Hispanic University here in San Jose. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your uh, mission and the work that you're doing. Uh, I think that the, uh, the things that you've talked about are important. I really am glad to hear that the gentleman at the left, I'm sorry, Mr. Nate, $50 trillion for if we can get Latinos and African Americans up to par with the other groups. I think that's $50 trillion. That's amazing. I'm going to go back to the university now and look at the Latino students say, you're, you're part of the $50 million uh, that, we're, that we're going to invest in. So, thanks. I do believe in systems, but I think the systems have to be changed in order to address the new realities. We have the demographic changes here in, in, in California for the last 50 years. We've had a three-tier system. 50 years ago, this governor's father created a system that really addressed the needs. We had the best scientists, engineers, mathematicians the world ever seen. Today, it's a different demographic, more diverse, so the systems need to respond to the needs and who they're uh, addressing. I'd like to also thank the Secretary for disseminating information on African Americans. You sent some information out about Lafayette Hill uh, Institution with a program called Call Me Mister, where they're reaching down into eighth grade with African Americans, early Congressman Honda, so that we can get these kids on an academic pathway to become teachers so that those African-American males can go back to those communities and make a difference. That's powerful. We're going to do the same thing with Hispanics at the National Hispanic University, especially males, because unfortunately, the Hispanic male has fallen all the way in the same path as the African-American. I appreciate that comment. Is there a question in there? Well, the question is, um, you know, as, as Congressman Honda said, this is all part uh, of, 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 of a whole. And I think what your commission has done is address that. I want to thank the commission for doing that. Okay, if we, maybe one last question, maybe this uh, lady up here in the room, yes? training and in fact I've been involved in working with a lot of the teachers here uh, in the school around ensuring that teachers are well prepared to do the job they want to do. We are um, fortunate that a lot of the incoming teachers have also uh, experienced the same kind of uh, social media technology rich environment that uh, students have and we use a lot of that kind of um, uh, technology based as well as uh, 
media-based uh, instructional strategy in, in preparing teachers. I think we have to also understand that education has to be active, it has to be interactive, it can't be the stage on the stage uh, just, you know, lecturing, uh, because uh, it's not the way that people really learn, and, I, and you're well aware of that. Uh, it's really important that uh, across the whole country, not just a few places, uh, we make the investment in enabling teachers to understand how kids are experiencing life and how they are learning uh, today. And one of the problems we have that we addressed in this report is that right now, what you get in preparing to teach is really different uh, in different contexts across the country. Whereas a doctor, you can expect them to learn a common body of knowledge, a lawyer will learn that. We don't have that uh, happening right now for teachers. So uh, you're entitled to have a teacher who knows how you learn, is appreciative of how uh, kids bring different experiences to the classroom, knows how to teach the content, and of course the new Common Core standards are gonna uh, move us even further in the direction of uh, active learning around technology-based as well as um, problem-solving uh, thinking uh, skills. So we're uh, in need of making those investments in uh, those programs. We're in need of being sure it happens equitably, and we need to be sure that uh, students' voices are part of the uh, process of designing the colleges of education uh, for the future. So thank you so much for that comment. I know a lot of you still have questions, but uh, before we have those evaluation forms, please feel free to give comments back to us on the evaluation form and uh, turn them on the way out. But now, uh, I'd like to introduce Congressman Hanna to provide some closing remarks. Thank you, Edwin, and uh, I want to thank the panelists and the Secretary for being here and sharing um, the, the thoughts and also the, the work that went into the report on each and every child. You should be able to get a copy of this. I think we have enough for those who came. If, if, we, if we ran short, you can go to our website and draw it down. It's, it's a very important piece of work. And I think that the, the, the diverse questions that came uh, up this, this morning from students and from educators and everyone else uh, really speak to the issues that we've been facing in this country for, for decades. Public education did not start from one genesis, one common uh, experience. Public education started from all parts of this country since the beginning of this country in 1789 when we ratified and started being a constitutional country. And so states' rights became the core Every state developed their own principles around which they developed their society, their community, and their schools. In the 50s, we became aware that some states had different principles than most of us thought. It was called separate but equal. And so when we saw that through the TV that brought those things into our living rooms, we started to say, this is not right, this is not fair. Said that Americans are fair people. So we had that struggle. And in that struggle, the federal government got involved because the Constitution was being violated, equal protection. I think that when we start to have this public debate on equity for each and every child in education and excellence, we have to maintain that mantra, each and every child has a right to an equity in education. That's different from saying all children have a right to equal opportunity. Statement of problem, solutions. One is more broad than the other. And now we're at a point where we understand the specificity and the importance of each and every child's needs. We do that, we have a great start. The state of California, the governor and these legislatures are in the right direction. They're talking about equity of resources. Now we're gonna have to help them trying to figure out how to align not only the community but legislators to figure out how we are going to place the appropriate amount of money behind each and every child. And we talked about how we do that. Some of us talked about, in the report we talked about weighted uh, students uh, in, according to their, their needs. 
So there's a variety of ways that we need to do, but I think this is the first step in a national public dialogue where public opinion is going to have to drive politics. When we all agree, and we've heard it all here, now some of us who are real quiet maybe don't quite agree. I want to encourage you to email us or write down an evaluation, the question or the comment or the sentiment that you have right now to allow us to address that because you deserve a response to how you feel about public school education. And so the, the promise of this country, I believe, is not only jobs and economy, but it's also the promise that our Constitution lays out for each and every one of us. And that is that we all have the equal protection of the Constitution and that we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can't do those three things if we don't have the wherewithal. We know that each and every one of us, each child can learn. The research shows that each child can learn. So is it not possible to have youngsters in Appalachia, the Gulf states, the Southeast, Northeast, the Midwest, to have the same quality education as a standard because all children can learn. But isn't it also possible and appropriate to have those teachers who are going to be in that, you know, engaged in the teaching learning um, process that they should be compensated appropriately. New Jersey is a great example. They decided from age three to five, I believe it is, to have early childhood uh, as, a, as a focus for the state. When they first started in 2004, there's only 15% of the teachers were prepared and competent to address those youngsters. In about six years, I believe, 85 to 90% of those who are involved in teaching those youngsters rise to a professional level and be compensated as such. Compensation training was important in order for, the, for that state to be able to move forward. So that's an investment. I think the president has the right arena. Universal preschool, the state say that we want to move and have equitable um, monies behind each child, perhaps rather than looking at the entire system, let's, let's, choose, let's choose a cohort, preschool, and link together and try to start that process for one step and build on top of each other. We have that genius to do that. And here we have the thought process that put it together in this document. Now it's up to us. The public needs to be engaged, aligned, and informed so that we can have that public support and demand the policymakers do the right thing for each and every child. And for that, I thank you for being here. And let's move forward for the sake of the children. Uh, everyone can just remain seated for just a bit while they make their exit.